So my name is Chris Harris. I work for a company called Tengen, who basically are the creators of MongoDB. Um, so what this talk is all about is I spend my time in the field doing a lot of consulting work of helping people adopt MongoDB. Um, so what I decided to do is a quick 20 minutes on the strategies of if I've got an existing application, where do I start, right? I have heard all this buzz about Mon uh, NoSQL and MongoDB, and, but I've got this big monolithic app. What do I do, right? So this talk is a quick 20 minutes on the sort of things that I've seen in terms of strategies people have used. So I thought I'd kick this off with looking at traditional architecture people, people have got today, right? So hopefully this is no surprise to you, right? So what we have is we have, you know, we've built web applications that talk to a browser. We had a web server, Apache, Nginx, whatever. Uh, and then we have app servers that have controllers and services in it. And then they talk to the database. It's pretty much how we build apps. The challenge in which we're getting is the users of the apps appear are asking for things way beyond just the browser. They're asking for, I want it to work on my iPad and my iPhone and my, all my other stuff in which I have, right? So we're getting pressure here and we're getting pressure here, right? So let's start with the top and work our way down. So HTML5 is coming around the door. Here it is. The whole idea now is rather than simply having the browser being my point of kind of entry into my system for users, what I'm going to do is I'm going to address the idea of having all these devices, but instead of driving out HTML, what I'm going to do is I'm going to release JSON services, right? So I'm seeing this trend. Who else is seeing this trend? All right, good. <laughs> it's not just me then, I'm not crazy, <laughs> right? So the idea here now is if I have a, a service that exposes JSON and I can move kind of controller logic up here that renders my view, kind of nice. Now I like this for a load of reasons. A, I can now use my app in all these different places but I've actually spent my life uh, before joining Tengen uh, doing a lot of middleware. So I used to be Spring Source and JBoss and Red Hat before that. So apps was my thing. And what I've been trying to do for years is basically break down monolithical apps. So I'm hoping <laughs> that we finally get to the point whereby if we are now developing these little services, the adjacent services for all our clients, we can kill this, I'm not going to swear, but uh, this big monolithical application development that people are building, right? And start about thinking of building services that are my product catalog or my user service or my X service. And I'm seeing this trend in particularly large organizations that are talking about uh, let's have one for basket management or order management, right? So if you build services, you can kill this monolithical big app and have little services everywhere that are JSON-based. Now, if I have little services, I have a little advantage here, right? So if I break this out at the right level, you've got to do this at the right level, right? You've got to say, this is order management and this is customers or whatever, right? They are two different part, distinct parts of the application. And they can talk to the individual databases. That's kind of cool. Right. But we still have a problem here. We have JSON up here. We have a fair amount of logic in the service, which is basically converting our JSON to SQL. Right? Yeah. Yes, you could argue the fact that you could get it to work, and you can. So you've got a mismatch, right? You've got JSON services trying to convert to SQL. So wouldn't it be nice? So you can see where I'm going here. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if I could have SQL, uh, if I could have JSON at the front end and 
maybe do a little bit of manipulation on the JSON, a bit of validation, a little bit of business logic in my service, and then store JSON on the back end, right? Well, the same model all the way through. This is what MongoDB does. This is what MongoDB does is a JSON document store that basically allows me now to store my raw JSON and do complex queries on it. So I've broken my little service down. Let's call it a book service for the sake of a very simplistic example. This is not Amazon, so <laughs> I've not ripped this out of a big bookstore. But it's the interesting part of, of using a book is that it's actually a very simple example, but it has some interesting characteristics. Because I got a book, right? So here's book. Uh, it's got a title, Programming in Scala. How many people program in Scala out of just general interest? OK. What about just Java? OK. That's quite cool. Right. So it's just useful to know what the audience is. So here you've got programming in Scala as a book. Um, now, books have multiple authors where the challenge is. So the challenge is uh, if a book has multiple authors, here you've got Martin, Lex, and Bill. So here's a join table in SQL, here's a, an author's table in SQL, and then I have to have a join table, right? So now, in order to insert programming in Scala, I insert here, I insert three records here, and I insert three records here. So I have to do a complex join in order to just get out the, what authors write which books. In Mongo, you're just storing JSON. So here you have a JSON document, one JSON document, which has an author, and the authors are arrays, right? So now I can get the book, programming in Scala with one query, and I may you know, now have Martin, Lex, and Bill. And the nice thing here is Mongo has no schema because it's just storing database, uh, storing JSON properties. So it can have certain authors that have additional metadata based on what the application is storing. Uh, you may want to do some aggregation, right? So aggregation becomes quite interesting. So here's an aggregation example with Twitter where you basically say, Aggregate, so this is one, one statement here that says, based upon, imagine I've got JSON documents that are representing my Twitter feed. So match me all my, twe uh, my, my tweets where the user has a follower count greater than zero and it has followers that are greater than zero. Based upon this document that I match, project me out a new document that looks like this with location, user, uh, and the number of friends that user has and the number of followers that user has, now I've got a mini document, and then group this by location, right? So you could do group by statements. But, so you can now do the similar sort of things you were doing in terms of group by and general queries in Mongo and having a consistent JSON representation from the top to the bottom. The other challenge in which I'm seeing is that there's increased volumes of, of writes in the system. So, yes, we could do this, and yes, we have a web server, uh, an application server and a web server, and then we have the database. Now, what's happening is rather than me just publishing content, so the Guardian, take the Guardian or any publisher, uh, or Guardian use MongoDB, that's why I called them out, but the idea, what they were doing is they're publishing data, right? So a big publishing house, article, news article, you know, I publish my, my, my current news. It's mostly read, right? People I publish the news, I read it. Actually, the users are demanding other things. They're demanding the fact that what I want to be able to do is rate the content, comment on the content, uh, maybe share the content with other, my friends, or even generate my own content and then go through some process, right? So now the ratio between read and write is changing. And this is becoming quite a challenge. It's becoming quite a challenge because this becomes my bottleneck, right? So how do we solve these bottlenecks? Well, traditionally, we did this. You know, we did app, we did a service, we did app caching, right? Put an application cache between my database, or my application and my database. That kind of works. It works. The challenge becomes of if I have large volumes of writes, now I have a bigger problem. Because what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to update the cache and update the database. So now we're updating two things at once, which is technically slower than updating one thing. Now, what I could do is, this gets even more complicated, is because my environment is not one app server, it's 25. Okay. So now if I'm updating a cache, updating 25 caches in the database is actually really quite expensive. Right, don't want to do that. So, uh, so the challenge of becoming is caching works really well for read-only data. Uh, it doesn't work so well when there's high volumes of writes. So what we want to do is can we, rather than trying to tune the database, a bit like this guy cutting his garden, which is kind of now ironic considering we talked about gardens this morning. But <laughs> I didn't know that beforehand, by the way. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to use this, right? I don't think community gardening <laughs> using a bulldozer is going to work, but... <laughs> Hey. <laughs> so here the idea is I've got a large data set. Uh, let's imagine I've got a large data set about users, uh, username. So what I'm going to do, this is how HBase works, uh, this is how um, MongoDB sharding works, is we chunk the data up into smaller problems. I've got limited amount of time. So the idea is now if I look at little chunks of data uh, to represent each user, so a user starting with A, is a chunk B, C, you get the idea, right? All these are different usernames are starting with certain letters and we chunk them all together. So if you chunk all the data together in a particular data source, it becomes quite interesting. Because now what you can do is you can say, right, let's imagine each chunk is 64 meg of data. Um, what we then do is we say, right, let's move the chunks across multiple machines. There are unique instances, right? So why can't you do that? So let's move all my chunks. I didn't write that slide. It's pretty. Uh, so now I've got all my chunks nicely balanced across all my four uh, database machines. And if I add a database machine, what will happen is the chunks get rebalanced automatically, right? It'll know that there's a machine over here that has no chunks of data, so it will move certain chunks to try to rebalance the cluster for me. All right, so now what I'm trying to do here is scale my database. So now I'm saying if I write Ziggity, which starts with a Z, then I know where he is, right? I know he's on shard one, so we write directly to shard one. Even if I had 500 shards, then it doesn't really matter, I'm only writing to shard one. Uh, now the challenge is if I get a lot of users in that chunk, then what we need to do is we need to break the chunk up into little chunks, right? So now they're both, there's still, cut it in half, you get two 64 meg chunks, and what you can do is you rebalance, right? So MongoDB rebalances if the chunk gets too big to the other servers. Now, if I do a read, if I read uh, Xavier here, then he starts with an X, clearly, then he's on node 5. So it's a direct read, right? So that's kind of nice. If I read multiple usernames starting with T and Z, then clearly I don't need to read node 1 because there's nothing on that node starting with that range. Uh, okay. So you end up with an environment whereby you have a client, the application. Now, because of my background, I argue the fact that this diagram is the wrong way around, but that's just me, right? The databases, for some reason, are on the top and the app is on the bottom. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> right? So here's the app. Um, it talks to a switch. You have multiple switches. And the switches know where the data is, so it knows if a query comes in for username Z, it goes to this shard, right? I'm not going to go into that, that amount of detail right now as I've got a limited amount of time. But the whole point is here now, what I'm doing is I may still have one service over here that's using a SQL database, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I've got this other service over here that's using potentially a sharded MongoDB environment. The next challenge that I've got is how do I do offline processing? Right? MongoDB works really well uh, as an operational database. So I'm serving my website right, of uh, baskets uh, or users or whatever the active my application is doing. That is my operational live data. Now, I may want to do some analytics. Like I may want to do analytics not on the live data, which you could use Mongo for, but on historic data. Right? So imagine I'm selling products and I'm trying to do uh, uh, kind of reporting based upon what's currently, what I'm currently selling. 
then I may use MongoDB. If I'm using what am I currently doing based upon the old data, then I may use Hadoop, right, to do offline processing, offline data processing. So what you end up having is Mongo talking to Hadoop, right? So Mongo and Hadoop, right? So you have mappers up here. This is your Hadoop mappers. They can talk to configuration servers that are part of the Mongo environment, and each configuration server knows where the data is. So what will happen? Oops, I'm running out of time here. What will happen is the data from each shard, then the chunks of data, are then moved to your Hadoop environment, and basically uh, you can then start doing offline processing with Hadoop based upon the data that I have in Mongo. Right. So what happens is the data actually gets moved. You can start. You may not want to start way up here with all the shards. You can actually run this with just a single server. Uh, with, if you just started with a single Mongo environment, you could just have a single server or a replica set. Uh, but ultimately, if you get to this environment, the chunks move. The interesting part about this is, if you saw, remember from the previous slide, Mongo has already broken up the data into 64 meg chunks. So what I don't need to do in my Hadoop environment is to basically re-split re all the data. I can take the splitting that's already in Mongo and push it straight into my mappers. It's just a, a performance improvement. So how do I do this? Well, basically, here's a classic example for word count. So here's a map in MapReduce. You know, I'm taking in some data. So I'm going to read, uh, read some tokens in the line. The only difference, really, with doing that with Mongo in terms of writing a map part of the MapReduce is that you have what's known as the Beeson object, which is the JSON representation of your data in Mongo. And now you can say, get value line, uh, which is, line is just a property in my JSON. It could be product, it could be whatever you want it to be. And that will then basically interrogate the JSON document and get that out, and then you can do your MapReduce job. Uh, the, the reduce is exactly the same as you have done traditionally because you write to a context. The context is uh, basically will depend on how you config, configure it. It could be write the, write the output straight back into Mongo if you wanted to do that, or it may not be. You may say, well, actually, we're going to leave the context, the output in HDFS, and then use Hive or Pig or whatever you want to use to then interrogate the data, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so we now end up in this world of kind of hybrid databases. So you may have services over here for online processing. Some of them will be for, you know, Oracle or it could be MySQL or tradi you know, traditional databases. There's nothing wrong with that. So you don't need to go and just suddenly go and replace all your, your, your systems uh, that use Oracle. That would be a bit crazy uh, off the, out, of the, out of the start. What you may want to do is just start off with one of the services, and you know, I'm going to say use MongoDB because, well, I am. Okay, one minute. Uh, and then if you want to do offline processing, you can pull the data uh, from Mongo into uh, Hadoop. And I'm seeing this basically start. Uh, a lot of people start like this, and then once you've got one service, you start to grow. So I'm basically have no time left. So you can download MongoDB. Uh, you can contact me. <laughs> I'm around for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm on Twitter. If you can't find me hanging around, and if you want a job, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. I'm assuming I don't have time for questions. I'm all right. I can take a couple of questions, apparently. One, two. Uh, a few questions, and uh, I would like to have the next speaker up here. The partition about the chunks, how is that typically done? Is this, uh, was this example uh, the normal way of doing, or do so, you use a hash? So what, how MongoDB works, it's range-based partitioning. So you pick a field in your data. It could be a product ID, it could be a username, it could be whatever you want. And then the Mongo will partition the data based upon that field. So you have to decide, you have to pick something in your data that can be partitioned appropriately. Yeah. I'll take one more. Hey, so given that I have my data in a MongoDB that's sharded across a bunch of nodes, 
and I want to analyze it with Hadoop. Is there a way to... So you mentioned that you have an input format that I can use it in Hadoop directly, but do you also leverage um, localize, localization? So I have um, the data on one node, and I want to process it on the same node. So if my Hadoop cluster is running on the same node like your MongoDB shards, I don't want to transfer all the data over oh, the network. You, you, so what we're working on right, right now, what happens is the chunks get pushed to Hadoop, MapReduce jobs, to the mapper itself. What we're working on is direct integration with HDFS. And that's kind of it's what a lot of people are asking for. Um, right. Uh, so what you can do is you can target secondaries. So each shard is made up of multiple servers, being a primary and multiple secondaries. The secondaries have replication. And then you, what you could do is, is have your Hadoop jobs running on the machine where your secondary is. And then you're not pushing data across the network. Yeah. I'll take one more. I shouldn't really, but I will. <laughs> So the question is, how does Mongo handle rebalancing? How well does it do it? So, so the, the, tr the way that Mongo partitions, so when data comes in, you have to define what's known as a shard key, which is the key in which you're splitting the data on. So you define that in your key. Now, the, you want to find a key that which you can split appropriately, right? So if I take a key like countries and I have all my data in Germany, then you can't split it, right? So you have to find a key that can be split. You, it's your responsibility as the application developer to decide on the key. Once you decide the key, then the rest of it becomes straightforward from our perspective because we just... You can turn the balancer on and off because you may obviously when you're under massive amount of load, you may decide that, actually, I'm already at 99% utilization. Don't try to rebalance now because you're just going to kill me, right? So you can turn it on and off based upon time or whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, so there's a, general, there's a general question on when do I use a NoSQL database compared to a SQL database? Right, so I, I'll say why. Uh, uh, my, uh, the reason that people are adopting NoSQL databases is, well, from a developer perspective, what they want to be able to do is change the schema very quickly, right? Because what they, particularly in agile projects, what they're doing is, you know, I'll do the first sprint, I'll show my boss or whoever it is and say, here's my app, and he's bound to come back with the same thing he always comes back with, that's nice, but I want all this other stuff, right? So then he has to go and change the schema, right? And that's been, you see this again and again and again with new versions of the app. So, why people are adopting NoSQL is the fact there's no schema. Schema is driven by the app. So if you make changes to the app, then you want to do that. So one of the big motivations is if you're seeing application data change very quickly or application modeling, the, the, the data itself changing structurally, people are looking at NoSQL to solve that problem. The other thing is from an operational perspective, I want to scale horizontally. Right? I don't want to buy a bigger box. I want to buy little cheap x86 boxes and go horizontal. Um, this, this is when the service thing comes into play, was the fact of if I do need to query across multiple, let's say, a rational database and a non-rational database, then I can go through the services to do that, right? I have this service is responsible for product, products, or actually for finance, for, let's say, payment. This is using Oracle. Then you have another one which is using product catalog and I have been kicked off the stage. <laughs> I'll talk to you later on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.